Welcome to Honey from the Rock, a podcast devoted to Bible exposition. My father, Jack Christensen, preached expositionally for over 50 years, first as a missionary to Pakistan and later as a pastor in New England. His legacy lives on in me. He often began his sermons with a little expression, and now a little honey from the rock, taken from Psalm 81, verse 16. The psalmist wrote, I would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Today, more than ever, we need to feed our souls on the words of God in the Bible. The crying need of the church is for God-centered, word-explaining messages. So now, my friends, a little honey from the rock. There is a meme being posted on social media that celebrates speaking up for oneself. It reads, I no longer shut my mouth when family members, friends, or associates step out of line. You're going to hear what I have to say. Trauma taught me to stay in a child's place and not speak up because it's seen as disrespect, but I'm a full-grown adult now. You will not talk to me any kind of way and think I'm going to let it slide. I don't care who you are. No one wants to be wimpy when people offend us or disagree with us. But is this in-your-face response wise? Is it Christ-like? Or is this a worldly attitude that Christians are adopting? James has been teaching us the wisdom way. The wisdom way is not how the world responds when people step out of line. James has just finished his extended exhortation about the evil power of the tongue in James 3. Now he talks about our attitudes when people step out of line. James writes in James 3, verse 13, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. The gentleness of wisdom is the wisdom way. When the boss is unreasonable, when someone insults us, when others put us down or treat us like dirt, how do we respond? Do we let them hear it from us? The wisdom way says we respond with gentleness, not harshly or snarky. People's actions test wisdom's way. Are we wise or wimpy? Do we follow worldly wisdom and snap back? Or do we follow heavenly wisdom and speak gently? James tells us to demonstrate our wisdom by our works and our words in these situations. He talks about two kinds of wisdom in James 3, verses 13 to 18. There is worldly wisdom and there is heavenly wisdom. Our works and our words demonstrate the source. Let's look at worldly wisdom first. Worldly wisdom produces pugnacious actions. Pugnacious actions in verses 14 to 16. James writes, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Our culture glorifies might, but considers meekness wimpy. The same militant mentality develops in Christianity. The meek are wimps. So we become fighting fundies who tear into anyone who crosses our path. 
Our pugnacious or militant attitudes, James tells us, don't come from heavenly wisdom. They come from worldly wisdom. Cal Thomas was at one time the spokesman for the moral majority and worked closely with Jerry Falwell Sr. He did it to promote evangelical Christian values in our society. But he left that work because he came to realize that it did not represent the values of Christ. He said in an interview, The great fault in the evangelical movement today is that we're disobedient to the commands of the one we claim to follow. What were those commands? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Care for widows and orphans. Visit those in prison. Seek first the kingdom of God. I want to be like Jesus. He ate with publicans and sinners or as I like to say, Republicans and Democrats. He hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes. That's what I want to be known for. I want them to see him in me so that they will be attracted to him. That is the purpose of my life. When you love somebody, regardless of their politics, it's very difficult for them to hate you and then you can have a real conversation. Do you want to convert them, or do you want to condemn them? Insightful comments from a very conservative writer. James teaches us that worldly wisdom comes from a pugnacious attitude in verse 14. This kind of Christian has a basic attitude problem. When we become militant, our attitude can be characterized in four ways, according to verse 14. Our attitude is characterized by harsh zeal. James calls it bitter jealousy. I like the word zeal better here because jealousy connotes negative ideas. Jealousy and zeal are actually the same Greek word. Zeal is personal devotion to a cause. All great leaders possess zeal, so it is a good attitude at times. But zeal can easily become bitter or harsh because of our sinfulness. We can become antagonistic when people don't see things the way we see things. We can bitterly denounce them and harshly criticize those who don't agree with us. Such a zeal comes from a worldly attitude. It is godly zeal gone sour. Secondly, our attitude is characterized by selfish rivalry when we become militant. The word translated as selfish ambition refers to partisanship, whether in politics or religion. It describes a party spirit, sectarianism, partisanship, it refers to the tendency humans have to promote one's own agendas, programs, or organizations at the expense of all others. The word was used in the ancient world of politicians who canvassed the area soliciting support for their party while advancing their own profit in secret. We Christians can fall into the trap of petty partisanship to pursue our own selfish ambitions. When we become militant, our attitude is characterized by arrogant boasts. James is talking about exulting or gloating over someone else because we won and that person lost. We could paraphrase this phrase as, do not gloat about your superiority. It is not Christ-like to see a winner gloat and trash-talk others, whether in politics or sports or anything else. Gloating is the sign of worldly wisdom, not heavenly wisdom. Do we gloat when Texas passes a restrictive abortion bill and say, Take that! We win, you lose! Is that our attitude? 
If so, it is worldly wisdom, not heavenly wisdom. The cause, of course, is right, but the gloating is wrong. Fourth, our attitude is characterized by distorted truth when we become militant. James says, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Truth is vital to our witness for Christ. There is a cause and effect sequence here. When we gloat over our winnings, when we boast about our success, the result is that we lie against the truth of the gospel. The world will get a distorted message of Christianity when it sees that kind of attitude. You see, my friends, it is possible to present the gospel of Jesus Christ accurately with our words, but so distort the gospel by our attitudes that people never see the truth. We end up lying against the truth of the gospel, even as we think we are being faithful to the gospel. We lie about the gospel with our pugnacious attitude. God will hold us accountable for such a distortion of his gospel message. Worldly wisdom comes from a pugnacious attitude, and worldly wisdom comes from a worldly source. Verse 15, James writes, This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. Our fighting spirit, our attitude, does not come from God, it is worldly. Do not be proud of such a redneck Christianity as if it honors God. James tells us that the source of such an attitude is earthly, natural, and demonic. It is earthly. The word means to be earthbound or developing from the earth and not from God. We become earthy in our attitudes when we fall into a fighting spirit. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, contrasts the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of this world is godless and bound by human nature, the flesh. Paul uses the same word in Philippians 3.19 when he writes about the enemies of Christ whose God is their appetite and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. And it is natural. This word natural is used in the New Testament as the opposite of spiritual. It refers to all that humans are apart from God. Worldly wisdom is human wisdom, and when we stoop to using the techniques and the approaches and the methods of this world to win battles for Christ, we are not spiritual, we are natural. We are operating in the flesh, we are carnal in our human nature and in our human abilities and our human methods. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 4, For though we walk in the flesh, that's carnal, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And it is demonic. Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, and his forces are seeking to undermine the cause of Christ. And one of the best methods that Satan has to accomplish that goal is to get Christians to act like the world, to act earthy, to act carnal. When we become bitter, angry, and filled with a fighting spirit, we fall into this satanic trap. That is what James means by demonic. He does not mean that we are demon-possessed. He means that there are demonic forces in this world bringing about strife, wars, and bitterness. Just look around at the world. Wherever you see people fighting over human ideas and goals, you will see the demons at work stimulating and provoking the fight. It is what demons do. 
That leads directly into what James says in verse 16. Worldly wisdom results in destructive anarchy. Anarchy. Satan is the master manipulator. He's the destroyer. Anarchy, chaos, and disorder are the tools Satan uses to keep this world under his thumb. Listen to what James says in verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. The word that James uses here for disorder may best be rendered anarchy. Every evil matter, issue, or practice is the result of jealousy and selfish ambition. Selfish ambition sows evil and chaos in this world. Once again, look around at our world. You will see it. Wherever you see evil and chaos, you will see jealousy and selfishness. And when Christians get into that same fighting spirit, the result is often anarchy as God's work disintegrates and confusion and chaos mark the church just like they mark the world. Such confusion and chaos among Christians are from this world and destroy our testimony in this world. J. Frank Norris was a leading fundamentalist preacher in the 1920s. He was a dogmatic and fiery preacher who regularly attacked everyone with whom he disagreed, preachers included. He called one leading Texas pastor, the infallible Baptist Pope, the great all I am, and the Holy Father. Another pastor he called the old baboon, one Sunday, Norris preached in his church on the 10 biggest devils in Fort Worth names given. He was referring to his fellow pastors who lived in the preached in that area. The name calling is bad enough, but J. Frank Norris is best remembered for his celebrated legal case that made the front page news all across the nation. Norris verbally attacked from his pulpit on a Sunday the Roman Catholic mayor of Fort Worth, Texas. He said the mayor wasn't, quote, fit to be the manager of a hog pen, unquote, among many other insults that he threw his way. A man by the name of D.E. Chips was the mayor's friend and threatened Norris on the telephone. Then Chips came to Norris's church office, and there was an argument in the pastor's office, and Pastor J. Frank Norris pulled out a gun, shot, and killed the man. It was headline news all over America. The jury later acquitted Norris, ruling that he acted in self-defense, but the cause of Jesus Christ was undermined for years to come by his pugnacious actions. Such a fighting spirit comes from worldly wisdom, not heavenly wisdom. Because heavenly wisdom, James will tell us, produces peaceful actions in verses 17 and 18. Heavenly wisdom produces peaceful actions. Listen to James. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We must not compromise truth for peace, but we must communicate truth in peace. There is a basic principle of human relationships which we find in verse 18. You reap what you sow. You get what you give. In terms of human relationships, whether those relationships are family, church, work, or neighborhood, you reap what you sow. You get what you give. If you sow anger, pride, strife, conflict, and jealousy— you will reap the same in return. 
you usually get back what you give out. People tend to respond the way we treat them in our personal relationships. This is, of course, now a generalization, and there will be exceptions because of the sinfulness of human hearts. It is, however, generally true. Just watch how different people react to you in response to how you treat them. Anger breeds anger. Bitter words produce bitter words in return. Name-calling leads to more name-calling. Nasty posts on Facebook provoke nasty posts in response. James says that heavenly wisdom produces peaceful actions because peace is the fruit of righteousness. We Christians are to sow the fruit of righteousness. Now, that's an interesting expression because we all know that you don't sow fruit. You sow seed that produces fruit. Fruit is the result, but fruit also contain, contains the seed for new fruit. Literally, James is talking about sowing fruit. We say something similar today, farmers sow a crop. The result is the purpose of the seed. I think James is saying here that the fruit of righteousness is all of these characteristics. You sow these character traits into your life by practicing them until they become part of your character, part of who you are. The fruit is the seed that becomes the new fruit. James is saying you become what you do. Therefore, do it until it becomes a part of your nature to do it. There is a little saying that expresses this idea quite well. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap your character. Sow your character, reap your destiny. James lays out for us seven fruits of righteousness in verse 17 that we are to sow into our lives until they become part of our character. Heavenly wisdom is characterized first by purity. The word means moral integrity. We must not become polluted by the immorality and lust of this world. Friends, if you read and watch smut, you will become smutty. It will take over your mind. It is really that simple. What you fill your mind with is what you will become. Peaceable. Heavenly wisdom is peaceable. Heavenly wisdom seeks to heal divisions and conflicts, not continue the arguments. Now, peace must not be at the expense of moral purity. We must not seek peace in place of purity. But even as we stand for moral purity, we must hunger for peace. Even as we stand for what is right, we must desire peace with those who do wrong. A peaceable person does not look for ways to put someone in their place, even if they're wrong. We are not the morality judge. God is the morality judge. If it wasn't for God's grace, we would be condemned, too, for our immoral attitudes and actions. We need to ask, are we trying to convert people by God's grace or condemn them by our attacks? Gentleness. This Greek word is not easily translated into English. One scholar calls it the most untranslatable term in the list. If you check different translations, you will find a wide variety of ways it is translated. Basically, it conveys the idea of respect for other people. We must be fair and considerate toward others, especially if they disagree with us. We're not to be rigid and perfectionistic and judgmental in our expectations. We must treat people with respect at all times. Every person we meet is made in the image of God, and we must respect them as fellow image bearers. One writer calls it 
sweet reasonableness. We are to act with sweet reasonableness toward other people. And that leads us to teachableness. The Greek word translated as reasonable means yielding to persuasion or willing to yield. A person who is willing to yield listens to or reads an opposing viewpoint seeking to understand and willing to change if the opposing viewpoint proves to be true. It's not that such a person is gullible, but that she or he is open to new perspectives and willing to learn from other people. She doesn't listen to argue, but listens to learn. In other words, this person has a teachable spirit. There's nothing worse than talking to a Christian who has all the answers and is not open to considering other possibilities. He is not teachable, and there's little you can do with him until the Holy Spirit teaches him to be teachable. Merciful. Next, James talks about someone who is full of mercy and good fruits. This is the only double characteristic in the list. Mercy and good fruits go together. People who are merciful produce good fruits. Mercy is not compassion. Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve either. Mercy is the police officer giving me a warning instead of a ticket for speeding. Mercy is giving someone wobble room. Maybe they didn't say it quite right. Maybe they made a mistake. Mercy is letting it go when someone is out of line. It means not jumping all over them to straighten them out. Nonpartisanship. The New American Standard translates this Greek word as unwavering, but I like the way the King James translates it better. The King James translates it as without partiality, without partiality. It is the adjective form of the verb used back in James 2, verse 14, to prohibit discrimination. James seems to be saying that heavenly wisdom is not given to a party spirit. This person is nonpartisan. Heavenly wisdom is not always picking up sides, but maintains a nonpartisan partisan approach to life. My friends, God is not Republican or Democrat, so we can love both of them. Authentic is the next one. The word translated without hypocrisy means to be genuine, to be authentic. In other words, the Christian is not to hide behind a mask and play act his Christianity. She is to be genuine. Far too often we put on our holy faces when we come to church while living unholy lives the rest of the week. Such hypocrisy is not the product of heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom produces genuine, authentic people. Not perfect, but real. James wraps up his description of heavenly wisdom with peace. We can sum up all these characteristics in the word peace. Look at verse 18. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All these qualities characterize a peacemaker. We sow the fruit of righteousness in peace, in a peaceable way. We are peacemakers. Many today think that peacemakers are wimpy, but James says peacemakers are wise. Are you a peacemaker? How do we test our wisdom? It is certainly not a multiple choice exam. We test our wisdom every day in the crucible of real life. People act in ways that test us, and how we respond to those conflicts proves whether we are wise or not. We test our wisdom in our relationships with our wives, with our husbands, with our children, with our co-workers, with our church friends, with our non-Christian friends. 
they will test us to see if we are wise. They are looking to see if we exhibit the fruit of righteousness, which is sown in peace. People's actions test wisdom's way. Worldly wisdom produces pugnacious actions, but heavenly wisdom produces peaceful actions. So, my friends, are you a fighter or a peacemaker? Which is it? Pastor and author Chuck Swindoll tells the story of Dr. Bruce Waltke, a famous Bible scholar who was an expert in Hebrew and Semitic languages. They were touring the mother church of the Christian science movement in Boston with three other pastors. The four men went into the building and were greeted by an elderly lady who had no idea she was leading a tour with four clergymen. She led the tour and in time arrived at the point where she was explaining some of the doctrines of the Christian Science Church. In particular, she explained about their belief concerning no judgment in the life beyond. God doesn't judge anyone, she said. Dr. Waltke responded, But ma'am, doesn't it say in the Bible it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment? He was, of course, quoting Hebrews 9.27. Chuck Swindoll said he was thinking to himself, Go for it, Dr. Waltke. Nail her to the wall. The lady was obviously suddenly very uncomfortable. And she said, would you like to see the second floor? Dr. Walke responded warmly, we surely would. Thank you very much. A relieved expression came over her face immediately. She obviously didn't want to get into an argument with a bunch of preachers. As they proceeded upstairs, Chuck Swindoll tugged at Dr. Walke's arm and whispered, hey, why didn't you nail the lady? Don't let her get away with that. Bruce Walkey whispered back, Now that wouldn't have been very fair, would it? That wouldn't have been very fair, would it? Less than 20 minutes later, Bruce Walkey was sitting quietly with the woman alone, tenderly sharing with her the message of Jesus Christ. Chuck Swindoll writes, He, the gracious peacemaker, had won a hearing, and I, the scalp snatcher, had learned an unforgettable lesson. Are we peacemakers or scalp snatchers? My friends, the peacemaker isn't wimpy. The peacemaker is wise.